The Game Wave game system had a journey unlike no other device. It involved religion, allegations of being part of a pyramid scheme, and some very wacky games. This ultimate guide would take a deep dive into all these things, including a look at all 13 official games. I'm Kevin, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Richard Fast was a Canadian board game and toy inventor who had many successes under his belt, including the card game Mind Trap. In the early 2000s, he came up with a concept of a video game system that captured the same spirit of playing a board game with family and friends. It would be geared toward casual gamers, having games that would be easy to understand and short. The system would cost 50 Canadian dollars and function as a DVD player too, presenting a high value proposition. To bring his dream forward, Richard raised money and created the company Zappit Games, which in turn partnered with the already established company called Nitric to engineer the device. Although it wasn't the first time someone had tried to turn a DVD player into a game console, Nitric had enormous problems coming up with a device that would work under the specified budget. It went through development hell. Throughout 2004, Nitric experimented with different processor designs, but ran into programming barriers, licensing issues, and various technical limitations. They ended up bringing in the help of other companies, including Macrovision, National Semiconductor, Panasonic, and Altera. Finally, a prototype was delivered to Zappit in 2004, and game development began immediately, both by Zappit and Nitric themselves. It was during the development of the first few games that everyone began to realize the device had great graphical limitations. But it was too late to make any revisions, so they stuck to it. Against the other systems out at the time, it would not be able to compete, but they felt there was a niche audience out there who did not play those other systems. The GameWave Family Entertainment System became available to the public in 2005 at 100 Canadian dollars. It came with four controllers and the game Four Degrees The Architrivia Volume 1. A controller case came with it too. Inside the case was room for two extra controllers. Those could be bought separately, allowing the system to have six players simultaneously. The controllers came in six different colors. Each one had an A, B, C, D, which matches up with the multiple choice format of some of the trivia games that were on the system. There was also a number pad and a center set of buttons which function as a directional pad. These remotes could also be used when playing back regular DVD movies. An amazing amount of detail was put into the overall look. You can place the controller case beside the system to make it look like one seamless piece. Even though on the box they have a gap there, not sure why they didn't just push it together for the photo. When together, it forms a wave. And when you swing the door open on the case, it fits perfectly with the top of the system. Even the disc tray itself has the wave design built into it. The back of the player has composite out and S-video out. There's also a 9-pin mini DIN expansion port, whose intended purpose may be lost to the sands of time. The front has a power button, an eject button, and a prominent IR sensor. They designed the sensor to be extra sensitive, to make sure it had enough range for everyone that was sitting in the living room. Extra design had to also go into making sure it worked with six controllers at once, something a typical DVD player was never meant to do. For those of you who are thinking about getting one of these, I'll mention some issues that you may want to look out for. In early reviews of the product, some customers reported problems with the disc tray. It would stick or open on its own. Some reviews also mentioned the entire console failing altogether. This person who wrote this review said they had two of them that failed. I played 13 games on mine and did not encounter any of these issues, but I did notice a melted plastic smell every single time I played it. I thought maybe there was dust built up and it was like heating up the dust, but I checked the inside and there wasn't that much dust in there. The heat is definitely coming from the internal power adapter, especially around this part, which I think is a voltage regulator. Its position is very close to the edge of the case, so it might be heating up the plastic. Plastic. There's also a fuse inside, and if I had a unit that did not power on, that would be the first thing I checked. It may have blown and therefore needs replaced. Also note that many people have left batteries in the controllers over the years. So before you buy, make sure you get to inspect the battery chamber to see if there's any corroded batteries in there. 
One of the crazy things about this system was the distribution and marketing. At launch, the Game Wave was available at brick and mortar stores within Canada, specifically Toys R Us and Mastermind Toys. It was also available to rent at Canadian blockbusters. The Zap It website also sold them to both US and Canadian customers. By all indications, the thing did not sell very well. In this Amazon review in 2007, the customer indicates that they saw rows of these at Toys R Us for 50% off. That was about two years after the launch. Zappit didn't have the advertising budgets of the other big name console manufacturers of the time, but they tried many creative things to get the word out and to get more units sold. They were able to get it available on QVC, a home shopping TV channel. They also developed a version to be put into bars. At least one prototype was created and put into a bar. Though for whatever reason, they decided not to go through with this plan. They kept reaching and eventually began targeting the US Bible Belt. To do this, they created two new games, Four Degrees Arc of Trivia Bible Edition and VeggieTales Veg Out Family Tournament. It was thought that these two games, plus the overall family-oriented and non-violent nature of the other games, would be something evangelicals would want. Zappit managed to get positive reviews from many Christian sites and various family organizations, and Christian bookstores and websites began carrying the game wave. It still wasn't enough, so they continued to look for other ways to push the console. In 2008, the marketing strategy took its most bizarre turn. A clue about it found its way onto the official Game Wave blog. One of the employees of Zappit made a post about his admiration of the Tupperware sales campaign, which was waged through word of mouth get togethers staged by housewives in the form of Tupperware parties. The last sentence of the post was ominous. I wonder what product that people only get when they play it would benefit from that grassroots marketing model. In came a company called Buzz Agent. What they do is send free samples of merchandise out to people. In exchange, those people help spread the word about the product. The people who do the word spreading are called Buzz Agents. If you're a Buzz Agent, you can get something like a vacuum cleaner if you create a review for it. However, the majority of products they push are beauty products. Back in 2008, the Game Wave entered the world of Buzz. They sent an offer to Buzz agents. For $49.95, you'll receive a Game Wave system and four games. Our two systems for $79.95. Message boards lit up, with many Buzz agents complaining about having to pay for an item in order to review it. It wasn't something that they would normally be asked to do. Many Buzz agents said they repeatedly received this offer, even after their initial decline. Later in 2009, the offer was made again, but this time for $29.99. At this point, it seemed like Zappit was just trying to get rid of inventory. And to make things worse, this was all going on during the Great Recession. But some Buzz agents did say yes to the campaign. Recently, a set of Twitch streamers called RetroPals acquired some of the documents those Buzz agents received with their system. Among other things, it suggested having a game night to show it off, and it asked that they pass out coupons to people and let people borrow the console for a few days. The Buzz agents could then report these activities back to the Buzz website, where they could gain some perks like additional campaigns and credits toward gifts. Many people have interpreted all this as a pyramid scheme, but it doesn't really rise to that level. For one thing, the Buzz agents aren't trying to recruit other Buzz agents. The Buzz agents are just telling people if they like what they see to go and order one of these machines off the Zappit website. They aren't getting a cut of any of those sales. Regardless of how it's all classified, it does seem like a desperate attempt to get rid of the product. It is unlikely that the Buzz agent push gave way to a large number of sales, judging by the reaction of most of the Buzz agents on the message boards. While the push from Zappit to sell units through Buzz agents was going on, Nitric Limited had its own set of units on hand and they needed to get rid of them. Another company was created called GameWave Media Entertainment India Private Limited. In order to sell the console to India, to appeal to that market, they commissioned a 14th game, Quiz Connect. It was an altered version of one of the Four Degrees trivia games. The voiceover was done by a famous Indian game show host. Details are scarce, and it's actually not known if the system was ever released in India. A GameWave booth did appear at the World Book Fair in India in 2010. As for the game Quiz Connect, there's great doubt as to whether or not it was ever released. One copy recently showed up on eBay Canada. 
That sale also came with an update CD that made the console region free, and therefore able to play Quiz Connect. With all these things put together, one can surmise that this Quiz Connect is Zappit's own copy that they used for testing purposes. A prototype, essentially. Another way they tried to bring attention to the console was to bring it to the Easter Seals Telethon in 2008. Offering that opportunity to all the families as well as all the donors, so when they call in today, the minimum pledge of $250, we're going to gladly give them a game wave that they can take home to joy with their families as well. Regardless of all the ways they tried to market to people, none of them worked. It ended up selling only 70,000. Unopened packages are still floating around eBay. In those listings, you can see how they tried to move more units by including additional games, pretty much taping them to the outside of the packaging. While the Game Wave player failed, Zappit did not want to give up on the name or the game assets. In 2009, they made an attempt to port over some of the Game Wave games to iPhones, Blackberries, and Facebook. In a tech demo posted to YouTube, they showed how various people could play Arc of Trivia at the same time using multiple devices. At the end of the video, they directed people to go to playgamewave.com to download a sample. Later, in a blog posting on September 30th, 2009, they said a beta version was available to download on BlackBerry. That was the final blog posting they ever made. Zappit declared bankruptcy soon thereafter. The biggest legacy any system leaves behind are its games. So how are the games on the Game Wave? Me and my wife played all 13 confirmed releases and we have a lot to say. The games are Gems, Click, Letter Zap, Zap 21, Lock 5, VeggieTales Veg Out Family Tournament, Sudoku, 4 Degrees Arc of Trivia Volume 1, 4 Degrees Arc of Trivia Volume 2, 4 Degrees Arc of Trivia Bible Edition, Rewind, Rewind 2005, and Rewind 2006. They can all be divided into two major categories, trivia games and everything else. For the most part, the cases have a consistent design, though interestingly the Arc of Trivia Bible Edition doesn't show the Game Wave name on the spine, unlike all the others. So it kind of stands out, especially if you're really anal about that kind of stuff. The overall design of all three Arc of Trivia games is about as bland as you can get. They probably should at least put some effort into Volume 1 since that was the initial packing game, and its image was shown on the system box. The Rewind games look a little bit better, but the design on all the other ones look a lot better. The backs do a good job explaining the games, and don't have a lot of space taken up with legal stuff, like modern games do. Inside each case is a very well-written instruction manual. It seems to borrow the design from the instructions you find inside board games. Everything is kept short and to the point, and no space is taken up with the storyline, because for the most part, there is no story in these games. There's two games that have two discs, Rewind 2005 and Rewind 2006. The player actually has a built-in memory, so it'll remember which trivia questions you've already been asked. As far as the number of players, all the trivia games take up to six. Zap21 and Sudoku also take six. The remainder of the games max out at four players. When you put a disc in, there's quite a lot of loading that happens, about 40 seconds worth. At the beginning of each game, each player hits the select button to indicate they wish to play. It then prompts them to enter a name. It does not seem to have any restrictions as to what words you can use, so anything goes. The console knows what color remote you have, and it uses those same colors within the game itself. For example, when you answer a trivia question, it'll add a little blue indicator to the screen indicating that you answered. Every game also has an option to go through a tutorial, and those are extremely well done. So now I'm going to dive a little deeper into these games one by one. Bear in mind, we only had two players for each of these, so we may not be able to make a determination as to how good these would be in a large family setting. I'll also add some thoughts about single player experiences later. First up is Gems. Out of all the ones shown today, this is the closest you're going to get to a typical video game. It's a match 3 puzzle game. In mode 1, players swap adjacent gems to get matches. In mode 2, players take turns placing a gem. I thought this was going to be one of the best games, but I was hugely disappointed. The game field looks dark, like it has a filter on it. And the animation of simple things like gems disappearing and gems falling into place is severely lacking. I've never even thought about animation in a puzzle game, but after seeing this, I think I can say that this is the worst animation ever in a puzzle game. The sound effects are bleeps and bloops, but the music is serviceable. In the end, 
any other match three is better than this one. Next up is Click, and it's basically Will of Fortune. It proceeds at a reasonable pace, unlike some of these other games, but it has a lot of negatives. Me and my wife really hated the process of buying a vowel. When you attempt to do it, it basically rolls a dice, and you have the probability of being able to choose a vowel. Picking the letters at the bottom of the board is slow, and there's a delay, causing you to overshoot the intended letters. In case you're wondering how to actually solve a puzzle, it's based on the honor system. You say what you think it is out loud, and the other players judge whether or not you got it right. There are 300 puzzles in all. In the end, I thought the game was just okay. What a disaster. Letters app is Boggle, basically. In one mode, each player is given a cube of letters, and they have to see how many words they can form. In the other mode, players share a large cube of letters and do the same. If there's one game that'll give you carpal tunnel, it's this one. It's super easy to form small words, so you'll be constantly typing them out with the arrows, as fast as you can, which will really test the limits of your thumbs. Overall, like Click, it's an okay game. Next up is VeggieTales, and it's the only game that uses an existing license, and is one of two Christianity-themed games. Larry wants to show off his silly songs, but these crazy balls keep getting in the way. Help Larry by bashing as many balls as you can. It's a collection of minigames, most of which touch on the themes of Christianity. It's obviously meant for kids, so take my opinions as a grain of salt. Of all the games, this is the one that elicited a party-like feel between me and my wife. There's just so much to comment on and laugh about, though I think a lot of the humor was unintentional. You can tell they put a lot of work into this game. The cutscene animations are better than anything else in the system. However, there were some issues that hampered my amazement. You tell him, Junior! In this game, the balls move across the screen in a really poorly animated way. And on this memory matching game, the hand was surprisingly hard to control. Pretty much any game that involves using the directional buttons has similar issues. It's like that again with this game called Prop Hunt, where you have to move the circle to certain items. I found it very hard to place the circle exactly where I needed it. There was one mini game that was really well done. It had you watch a short cartoon, and afterward, it would ask you questions about what happened, what color something was, and how many people were there, and so forth. I thought it was very challenging. In the end, VeggieTales is the most memorable game on the Game Wave, but being an adult, there's not much motivation to go back to it. Because God gives us the power to love everybody, even our enemies. Here, you drop this. I don't think I want it after all. Next up is Lock 5, and it's basically a game of Yahtzee. I used to play Yahtzee, but playing it on the screen is not exciting at all. There's two game modes, but it's all just basically collecting numbers off of rolled dice. I think this one is a dud, and I think it would put your family to sleep if you busted it out. Next up is Zap 21, which brings a competent game of blackjack to the system. It's surprising to see a high-stakes gambling game on a family-friendly system. It has everything you expect to see in a blackjack game, including double downs and chips and the sound of the casino and so forth. What I really hate is how those sounds suddenly stop when you're placing a bet. It ruins any sense of immersion. Place your bets. If you're a fan of Blackjack, I think you would enjoy this, but you likely have many, many other ways to play it, even at the time when this game first came out. I imagine this game would be quite fun if you had six people playing it, because it does support six players, but you might as well just play with real life cards. Next up is Sudoku. I'm not a big Sudoku fan, and I had trouble imagining that it would be any fun to play it without just paper and pencil. But I ended up enjoying this game a lot more than expected. The number pad is tailor-made for this, having numbers 1 through 9, which is exactly the numbers you need to type into each square on the screen. You also have the ability to add little notes into each square. This will only make sense if you know how to play the game. They did a good job of making this a relaxing game, having a toned down appearance and relaxing ambient sounds. I didn't have many complaints about the graphics like I did the other games. It does what it needs to do. There are three variations, but me and my wife could not figure out how to play the third one. 
even though we listened to the instructions. I don't think I've ever played a game of Sudoku on a television screen before, but it's hard to imagine it working any better than it does here. The three Four Degrees Arca Trivia games I'm going to talk about as a whole, because each one is basically a reskin of the other. In my opinion, these games helped ruin the system, because each one is very talky and moves very slowly for a trivia game. Online reviews at the time also mentioned this. After numerous bank robberies, murders, and escape from an escape-proof Chicago jail, he was labeled public enemy number one by the FBI. During each player's turn, they pick a category and roll a dice. It bugs me that you're actually looking at the side of the dice instead of the top like one normally would. Those points represent the bonus that the dice thrower will receive if they answer the question correctly. But every player gets to answer every question. The sooner you answer, the more points you get. Before the time runs out, four clues are given one by one, with the last one practically giving the answer away. They also throw some bonus rounds in there that play a little bit differently, like having to put events in chronological order. All in all, these games move at a slow pace compared to other trivia games I've played. And I think that category wheel just looks so bland. Also, the wheel doesn't even really need to be there, it doesn't add much strategy. There's only a certain number of questions for each category, so gradually each category disappears one by one until only one remains. If every question and every category is going to get asked, there's not much point in actually picking the categories to begin with. I will say that the Bible trivia one is strikingly better looking than the other ones. Instead of relying on real life photos, it uses a lot of art which just comes across better on the CRT. One final comment about Arca Trivia is that I did terrible at it. I had to wait till that last clue almost every single time. And I'm someone who's kinda good at trivia games and I'm kinda good at answering Jeopardy questions. But these games just made me feel dumb. It might be because the questions are outdated, but I've played old trivia games before and didn't have a problem. If they were going for the casual demographic, I think they should have thrown some easier questions in there, at least at the beginning of the round. The last set of games is the Rewind series. They're trivia games based on recent events. Well, they were once recent. All in all, these are better than the Arca Trivia series. The pace is faster, and the overall presentation is less boring. The categories, however, are bizarre, and I think they're attempting to be clever, but you might as well just ask random questions. Like Arca Trivia, the categories deplete themselves. So it's a bit meaningless to have people select them in the first place. All in all, I would say the Rewind games are okay, but since the recent events are no longer recent, people will have difficulty answering the questions. And I certainly did. Just like the Arca Trivia games, it's probably too difficult for casual players. That's it for all the games except for Quiz Connect, which I spoke about earlier. It's just a reskinned version of Arca Trivia, so there probably would not have been much to say about it. If you're looking for a trivia game that's better than anything on the Game Wave, I recommend You Don't Know Jack on the PS1. Everything is better. The presentation value, the humor, the gameplay. Trust me, it's still fun to play today. Based on the two-player experience, if I were to rank these games from best to worst, I would put it like this. But what about playing solo? Are any of these games decent? in that regard. As it turns out, each of them can be played with one player. The trivia games are obviously a bit more enjoyable with someone else to compete with. Zap21 isn't so bad solo because you have the dealer to play against. But Sudoku was definitely the best solo experience, in my opinion. To be honest, most of the other games felt lonely without someone else playing. Before I finish the video, I want to touch on some other interesting things about the system. If you turn the system on without a game in it, a menu comes up that allows you to adjust the aspect ratio. Select a different language and manage your game saves. Now here's something really odd. I have in my possession an update disc, and I don't know exactly what it does. It's not like the one I talked about earlier that someone got with Quiz Connect. It seems like that disc only existed to make the player region free. This one is more professionally made, and the labeling tells how to use it, but it doesn't say what it's changing about the system. I ran it, and as it was going through the cycle, it seemed like it was doing a lot of things. But afterward, I went through the system menu, and I also popped in the game and played it, and nothing Something seemed different. Perhaps they found a bug in the programming and this fixed it. Maybe the bug was specific to one game, or it could be something to do with DVD movies and how they're played back on the system. If anyone knows the true answer, please let me know. Speaking of DVD playback, what happens when you stick a GameWave game into a regular DVD player? As it turns out, nothing happens. It doesn't even read the disc at all. All in all, the GameWave was a good concept. 
but with the development hell it went through that resulted in underpowered components, it had an underwhelming life as a game system. Not even an everything but the kitchen sink marketing strategy could save it. So it sits in closets, it sits in landfills, and it sits in unopened boxes, just waiting for someone to give it some attention. At least I gave it some. Thank you for watching this ultimate guide. If you want to support future endeavors like this, consider becoming a Patreon member. You'll get early access to these videos and you'll get bonus behind the scenes footage videos that are Patreon exclusive. If you want to know more about me and this room I'm in, be sure to watch the Q&A video right here. May your games make you happy and smart and may people respect you for playing them. So long everybody.